Um, thank you very much for the invitation. And I hope that you are all well and safe. And I know the world has had um, just a terrible time with a pandemic. And a pandemic that, um, you know, just keeps, keeps coming round. And in New Zealand, we've been in another form of a, a lockdown. So I haven't been to my own home for a few weeks um, because my father, who's 95, 94, and my husband are both not well. So I have to kind of stay out of where I normally live and work um, just so that I could keep my own family safe. And it's a kind of interesting time in a pandemic forces us to think about um, things and for Indigenous peoples, uh, what the pandemic does and has done is reinforce these huge inequities and injustices um, that's actually in our oral histories and memories of the 1918 um, influenza epidemic, which also hit our communities hard. So I know everyone um, suffers, but some suffer more. Some are excluded more from access to health. Um, some never get the opportunity to be well. They start unwell and it doesn't improve. So on an everyday basis, I think um, <clears throat> I get reminded of what it means to be Indigenous for Indigenous peoples around the world. That's who I focus on, but clearly there are other huge millions and millions of people um, who are classified in so many different ways. You know, minority groups, ethnic communities, um, religious minority groups, and this classification system of us, of humans, uh, is a system that I link to imperialism and colonialism and concepts of race and racism, concepts of difference, um, and the powerful um, way in which those categories of humanness, of being human, mark our experiences, um, our identities, and our opportunities in life. Not just our sovereignty or self-determination, uh, which we argue for as Indigenous uh, peoples, but our opportunity to live and to, and to have a life. And, you know, if there's if I think the world is, um, my world is too comfortable, I really just need to look within my own family uh, to see part of what I'm, part of what drives me and uh, keeps me thinking about the role of colonialism, colonization, settler colonialism, uh, whatever the term people are, are use, and you know, what that has meant for my community, for Māori people generally in New Zealand and for Indigenous peoples internationally. I see colonialism, well, I've studied, I guess, that aspect of colonialism that relates to knowledge, the, the epistemological project of colonialism uh, for want of a better term, the way in which colonialism was also um, a, a significant exercise in extraction and appropriation of other people's knowledge, representation of that knowledge, uh, which Edward Said writes about um, incredibly eloquently, um, the erasure of 
knowledge, the theft of knowledge and cultural artifacts within which knowledge resides, uh, which provides cues to knowledge. The banning and prohibition of language, our languages and cultural practices. So when we think about colonization and colonialism in terms of knowledge, um, I always think New Zealand is quite a classic study in that. And the reason I think that is Captain Cook's first voyage to New Zealand was a scientific voyage. It was described as that. It was funded um, as that. It was like a great science adventure, you know, going out into the Pacific, studying the transit of Venus, and then traveling on to New Zealand, which um, Abel Tasman had, had arrived at um, a few years earlier, but still this kind of sense of the very language that is used to describe colonialism um, is also the language that's used, that's imbued in science um, and in the way people talk about knowledge. Uh, in English, at least, and, and I'm sure in some other European languages. So words like discovery just seem the shivers up um, most Indigenous people's bodies because, not like, we didn't really need to be discovered. We were doing perfectly well um, on our own. And that sort of constant interplay between science and knowledge and colonialism and power um, is really the story for me of colonization. Uh, it's not unique to Māori. Uh, I think every Indigenous peoples around the world have a variation of that. Uh, but uh, what I've sought for are those themes, um, ideas that link our experiences, join them up and demonstrate a sort of deeper narrative um, around the, the impact of European um, imperialism, scientific imperialism, uh, colonialism that really I think started in from the Enlightenment, I, I call it the Enlightenment, um, but definitely a period of European expansion um, and the beginning of instruments that could help <clears throat> ships navigate uh, away from the shoreline further and further um, from definitely out of Portugal and uh, Spain and Italy and eventually able to um, sail around the world that they finally discovered was round. Um, so <clears throat> the knowledge project hasn't stopped, right? In the same way as colonization hasn't stopped and colonialism hasn't stopped, that they take on new forms, but the the deep encoded uh, nature of um, colonization in our lives means that it kind of it's like every generation of us is having to contest uh, what, what it means. And the power of knowledge and, and Western classification systems of knowledge are just part and parcel of everyday life and deeply entrenched and embedded in, <coughs> excuse me, in academic life. I mean, universities are testimonies to, and, and yeah, that they're their own testimonies to this kind of colonial project. And 
they teach it, which means they reproduce it. And they teach it to us, those who've been colonized, and we learn it. Um, and <clears throat> some of us are absorbed in it and eventually assimilated and have no choice. And then for those of us who question it, it just takes us to a, um, a journey that, you know, we're just constantly living with this um, really epistemological dissonance between the way we might have been brought up and raised and what the university teaches and teaches us. So, you know, much of my career in uh, the university, I've been in uh, three, University of Auckland, uh, University of Waikato, which I've just left, by the way, and I'm now at a tribal university. You can see the name uh, above my head. It's 30 years old, teaches to PhD level, um, was founded by my father in my uh, tribal area. I has several thousand students, not all of whom are indigenous or Maori, has several campuses. So I'm really pleased uh, in a way to be home. Uh, but it also, this place does my head in as well, as much as a university does, because it's, um, yeah, it's a tribal university, but it's also bound by the legislation and rules of what makes a wānanga. It's a wānanga, um, a place of learning. And in fact, in New Zealand, the wānanga is not allowed to use the term university because the universities of New Zealand um, are very good at ganging up on other institutions and um, believing that they hold the name, the legal identity of a university and that it's so special that only they can hold it. It's um, in their view enshrined in law and that other institutions like the one I'm at and there's three of these institutions um, cannot use that term to translate what in Māori it actually says, te whare wānanga or awanuārangi, which is the house of higher learning of awanuārangi, who was an ancestor. Universities translate themselves when they use the Māori language as te whare wānanga or tāmaki, the University of Auckland. Te whare wānanga or, you know, Otago, the University of Otago. So they can use and appropriate our language for, for their purposes. Uh, but we are at the moment uh, in a stalemate about whether we can translate Māori language into the English language. How ironic is that? But how illustrative is it of what I'm just talking about. You know, the power of the academy to hold on to um, its own definitions of, um, and very elitist definitions of itself, that they define themselves, govern, for the most part, believe they govern themselves. Although there've been many attempts to diminish that governance. Um, and, and are the arbiters of what counts as legitimate knowledge and the rules of that knowledge and what are the valid forms for producing that knowledge, how that knowledge is assessed, what makes it excellent what the rules are, you know, which most of society don't understand. And for those who are excluded um, from that world, they have no comprehension of what this inner world of the academy is 
and the extent to which it reports mostly to itself and is accountable to itself. Um, and I don't, you know, I've been around long enough to know it's not a, a single organism. Um, it has its own systems and universities are different from each other. But as there's no other place in society, there are no other institutions in society quite like universities. And if, and if you want to test that, try and change them. Try and change a university because that's been my entire career, trying to change the academy. It is brutal work. It takes obviously more than a generation to do that. And by the time some changes have occurred, um, you know, they are the ones that need to. And just to give you an example, you know, for many of um, those of us who work in the equity space and um, inequality space, the, the arguments about gender and women uh, in the university here in New Zealand, you know, have really been in parallel to the work that I've been doing um, in terms of Indigenous inclusion and Māori participation in universities. One of the critiques that we, we have as Indigenous um, people, and I think other ethnic minorities would have as well, is the great push for equality of opportunity that came for us really in the 1960s, 1970s, advantaged women white women in particular, but did not open the door wide enough for others to come through. And, you know, I remember standing in a corridor in my department at the University of Auckland, and I had applied for promotion. And I was standing next to a woman colleague and she was absolutely shocked and said, why have you applied for promotion? I said, oh, I thought it was like lotto. You know, you just put in and see what happens. And, um, you know, I knew it wasn't like lotto. But it was just this, like, you know, no, it's not your turn. You know, you need to wait a few years. You need to do this to your career. And you need to do that to your career. And, you know, you've got to spend time. And I, I just looked at him and said, why do, you, why do you think that following the rules that have locked us out are going to let us in? That just makes no sense to me. Like, for a start off, I'm older. I'm going to have to jump a, through, uh, uh, jump a decade because I started in this um, career after a career in school teaching. So there's no way I'm gonna be able to catch up in my lifetime. So I need to think about this as, you know, hurdles. I'll just jump a few hurdles very, very quickly. And then um, we really need to, you and I need to apply for promotion now, or we're gonna be dead before we're even eligible uh, for associate professorship. And we went our separate ways and she followed the rules and I didn't. Um, and I mean, in a way, I advanced a little bit faster than her in the early steps. And then we ended up at the, on the top step, um, I think within two years of each other, but virtually near the end of our, um, you know, major teaching careers. So, I always think about that um, when I'm thinking about change in a university, that change takes lifetimes and it wastes people's lifetimes. And the very mission of indigenizing a university in New Zealand, decolonizing a university is an intergenerational challenge 
our major universities were set up um, before, coloni before the colonizers left England. The University um, of Otago in Dunedin was imagined in Scotland um, and it's based on um, Scot the Scottish idea of a university and the University of Canterbury uh, was imagined in England and was already laid out uh, before settlement really um, took place. And you can imagine whose lands those universities are on. The tribe that I come from, the tribe that established this institution, had our lands confiscated uh, in the 1870s for being in rebellion to the crown. Our position is we were defending our lands and our territories. The, the injustice of it for us and for the story I told earlier is that the confiscated lands were given to endow the University of Auckland. And despite um, our efforts of our institution to build a relationship with that university, I mean, they sold the land. Um, you know, the university has no memory, has no memory of that. It's in their history of themselves. But the power of these big institutions is even the power to say which memories matter. Linda, I'm not sure if you are talking or you are talking to the person. Hopefully, Linda is in the process of. Um, be joining us. Yeah, that was such a powerful presentation so far. Yeah. Uh, we have normally gone for another 10 minutes. Well, um, we do a bunch of sandwiches. Unless she's back. Just move back as well. Oh, Linda, you're back. Could you, uh, great. I think we lost you there for just a, a second. Linda. Sorry, I'm oh. back. That's lovely. Okay, please, please carry on. Yeah. I maybe that was a sign for me to stop <laughs> <laughs> and invite questions. Uh, but it, it, yeah, I can't remember now where where I stopped, but. I was telling you the story really of, of this institution I'm in and the and the basically yeah. Yes, she was she's gonna wind the down. fact that universities can then I mean, my goodness, I'd like this. <laughs> Why don't we do the first one? Yeah, we could Linda, we can um we were just on the point of saying how institutions had um the power to say what memories counted, what memories really yeah. existed at all. Um, right. Yeah. I hopefully you can hear us. In the, let me just explain that normally um, what we would do at this point when you have, uh, uh, if you are uh, in, at the point of inviting questions, is to break into a discussion in a room here and in breakout rooms online for 15 minutes. Uh, so that in these discussions we generate questions 
and then we come back to you. Yeah. Um, that would be good. That would be great. Okay, that's super. So um, let me invite you then to take a break for 15 minutes um, while uh, we do that discussion. Um, and then if you can join us again um, at, uh, yeah, uh, for us it's 7.25 here, 15 minutes time um, in any case. Um, that was so powerful, Linda. Thank you so much. Marvelous. Gives us lots of food for thought. Okay, so we will come back to you in 15 minutes time. Okay, thank you so much. Please use your bring out your discussions to generate questions and we'll come back to you. Oh, yes, yes. Thank you. 
You can either write your questions or indicate by raising your hand that you want to put a question. Uh, and in the room, if you also raise your hand, and Mered is patrolling with a mic um, so that um, you will have, um, can put your questions in the room. Um, who would like to uh, ask a question then? Can you say who you are, please, to help Linda? Hello, I'm Kazu Hall from MAIED. Thank you for your talk. And I have a question about cultural translation. And um, I thought, as lovers, we we try to translate in English all the concepts and all the words are made by made in English. So it means made by or some people or it's it made by people who speak English. And it means um so we cannot get out of westernization as long as 
we speak in English or we try to translate into English? Or is it a little away? Or of course we can put some background or some context into the translation. Maybe it makes the work longer, but we can yeah, explain the more, but it's just a better way. Or <laughs> it's um, do we have still a way to avoid formalization or westernization? Thank you, Kazuo. Another question in the room? Linda, are you happy to take a couple? Yeah, okay, thank you, Linda. Yeah. Thank you, Linda. My name is Obi, because I have a PhD in the state. We have now, it's, we have a conversation here in terms of uh, being, you know, being black in England and being black in Italy. Uh, being black in Italy is, yeah, the racist is in your face. <laughs> but being black in England is not in your face, but it's more deadly. So, so that is, so the European project is, it, it, it's, it's hard, I don't know what, how, you know, I don't know what to say, or in, you know, in Italy, um, being that in Italy is in your face and you know what you're dealing with. And in England here, yeah, it's not in your face and it's so, so bad, it creepy. It kind of, it costs you all the time. So, so, so again, linking back to the language you were saying because we're saying something, we still have a lot of people trying to learn English. People from China, people from Africa, people from all these things. And when you say something about uh, uh, colonialism is a scientific project. So, because for, for, for the University of Sussex to be taking the heavy amount of students they're taking, they must be selling their colonial project really well. One more question and then we'll come back Thank to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I am Musa, I'm a student at the um, Institute of Education and Social Work. Um, what I want to ask um, Linda is simply that is there any advantage to authority to colonialism? As we, I mean, uh, blame colonialism for all these uh, disadvantages the indigenous people, indigenous knowledge sources, could there be an advantage in colonialism? Thank you. Okay, Linda, um, over to you with these um, three questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not sure if I heard. Um, them well enough to, to know that I'm going to nail um, an answer for you, but thank you very much uh, for your questions. I think on the question of, you know, cultural translation and the power of the English language, I mean, yeah, that's what, <laughs> that's very much um, what, you know, what, what, is a constant for us in terms of how meaning is set, um, what counts as knowledge, how, how knowledge is um, expressed and, and understood. And it, it's one of the reasons why there's this great language revitalization um, of indigenous languages um, across the world and why for us in New Zealand, the, the Māori language has become um, really important as a vehicle for our own knowledge translation, <clears throat> to understand our own philosophies and understanding the relationships with the world, for example. But the reality is we move in and out of English and um, we are very good speakers of the English language. So we're having to do multiple levels of translation. You know, one is to how do we wield the English language so that we can use it 
and express it in a way that makes sense to us? How do we um, not so much get, get the, you know, the English cultural capital um, of the English language, but being able to use essentially the master's language to reconstruct and help us build our own language, um, to help us connect with our own people and people like us around the world. And at the moment it's English, but I know with colleagues in Latin America, it's Spanish. Um, and I know with colleagues in the African continent, um, it's other European languages that we learn to speak through to each other and speak around, um, you know, which is part and parcel of this sort of epistemological dissonance that we constantly um, struggle with. The fact is in, in New Zealand, you know, English is the dominant language, but it is not the official language. The um, official language of New Zealand, there too, in terms of legislation, the Māori language um, and sign language, and the English language is dominant by just being. It is the kind of unstated language of how things happen. But you might have noticed, um, even in New Zealand, um, there's a, a greater emphasis on bilingualism uh, as a strength, whereas it used to be seen as a deficit. I think in the, um, I'm not sure if that satisfies the question um, that was asked. I hope it does. Um, the, the second question I didn't quite, you know, understand about, you know, I guess the, the different contexts of being Black in Italy or England, uh, uh, what I heard and the, the way, um, you know, whether you're, whether some things are, you know, more of a struggle or less of a struggle or um, issues are more visible or less visible, sharp, more sharply defined or less sharply defined. I mean, I think context, it, it's often all about the context in which we're in. I think what my work speaks to is that you're not alone. We're not alone. You know, that if we look across the world, there are other peoples, peoples of color. There are other peoples who are minorities who are trying to navigate these contexts. And it's important to take not only comfort um, and pride in what they're doing uh, and comfort for, you know, what we're trying to do, but take inspiration uh, from them as well and also contribute, you know, support. Um, because it's not all Indigenous peoples are situated um, politically similarly. I'm here in the comfort of a first world country of New Zealand. Um, I have brothers and sisters, you know, Indigenous brothers and sisters who are barely able to live uh, in some countries. We're being an Indigenous activist is putting definitely a target on your body. Um, we're in COVID, you know, if you're in, we're in Brazil uh, and we're an indigenous and poor, um, you were left to fend for yourselves. So our story is, is we're not all at the same part of a journey of deep colonization or, you know, self-determination. Self I mean, the great, accomplishment of Indigenous peoples is the fact that they collaborated globally to develop, draft, and get through the United Nations, the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Remember, Indigenous peoples are not countries. The UN is a, a body of countries. So for minority indigenous peoples around the world to come together to de develop a declaration and have countries vote for it um, is a significant accomplishment. 
our own country, my own country, New Zealand, did not vote for it initially, nor did Canada, nor did the US. And you can imagine why not, why they would not have. Um, the fact that they gang up all the time with each other is not a surprise to us. Eventually they have, and I think that's just shaming, you know, how countries might shame each other to do something. So our, our contexts are really different. And, 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 and in a way, there's another lesson, I think, that you can take from the, the struggle of Indigenous peoples. I call it, um, I sort of describe it as a room at the table. If you can imagine a large table that's set ready for dinner, and there are a few pe people there uh, who've managed to get there. Um, they found their way there and they're sitting at the table and they're, they're waiting. And they're waiting for all the others who also need to arrive at the table. And our table is not fully set yet for dinner. We can't start really to feast because there are people who can't arrive. And then somewhere at that table is a kind of chair that's representative of all the peoples who are missing and those peoples who've literally been wiped out, who no longer exist. So there's a chair at the table there that will always be absent of a person, a representative. And so sort of, I sort of use that image symbolically just to kind of re remind me that those of us who are currently able to be at the table, um, we're not a full set. And those of us there have responsibilities to find, to search for, to reach out to, and to support those who are trying to make their journey. We can't make some of that journey for them. You know, part of it is there is a whole struggle inside a place. They have to emerge. They have to mobilize and organize. They have to understand who they are and who they're not. They have to reclaim. They have to kind of revitalize have to have this sense of all these things that some of these projects, if you like, that are in decolonizing methodologies, and they have to choose that this is the journey they want to take. Um, and who knows, and some might want to leave the table as well. That's a possibility. But the, the struggle of Indigenous peoples, I think, has some um, really important lessons in survival, resilience and resistance, um, this desire to live as authentically a life as we can and being indigenous, you know, what that understanding what that means um, and being able to hold different knowledges and navigate between them to make a better life. I mean, to be honest, you know, when I look through in different Indigenous philosophies and then I look at the West and where, where, the, where the Western thought has taken us today, it's actually taken us to a place of planetary crisis where, where Earth is in crisis and where are new ideas and new paradigms going to come from because they're not currently coming out of the West. You know, look south, look to other knowledge systems, look for other ways to relate to the environment. Um, because, you know, I just think some elements of Western ideology, Western ideas are dead in the, dead in the water, um, not relevant, not helpful, not going to get out get us out of a climate crisis. You know, the, the one sort of 
generalizable idea that Indigenous peoples have is that the environment is out there are our relations. We're related to trees. We're related to um, worms and frogs and birds and animals and grasses and everything is a relationship. And we have responsibilities as humans in that relationship. And it also means everything like mountains and rivers and stones and rocks, everything is there is an entity that needs to be respected. It's an ecosystem. You remove things out of it, you damage the ecosystem. Anyway, a very long uh, response to your question, and I'm not even sure I answered your question, and my, my apologies if I didn't. And then the third question I really didn't get, um, sorry, uh, I guess about, I think I maybe answered it around the positionality of uh, Indigenous peoples, um, to what extent that advantages or disadvantages. I think, you know, try being Indigenous in some countries and, and you're likely to be killed. Um, so, I, and, and I'm not just talking about, you know, countries that we think are developing. Um, there are many parts of the world where it's dangerous to be Indigenous. In the same way, as it's, it's risky being a person of colour. It's risky being a person with a different gender. Um, you know, it's not a good place when uh, there are only a certain kind of humans who are allowed to exist. Thank you, Linda. Uh, that's um, a very powerful answer. Um, uh, quite a deeply pessimistic answer, but very critical of us in the global north. There are a couple of questions in the um, in the chat room. Um, uh, so from John Pryor, what does decolonizing methodology look like for those of, of us from the global north? Is such a thing possible? <laughs> <laughs> I are. love that question. I asked that question too. You know, it's in England a few years ago, and it's like. So if you decolonize your curriculum in the, in the UK, what's left? That's my question to you. If you decolonize knowledge in the UK, what's left? If you decolonize your museums, what's left? If you decolonize your libraries, what's left? I mean, it's a different kind of question. I don't know what the I don't know what the answer is, but it's a fabulous question. You know, what does it mean to um, decolonize when you you don't necessarily have this indigenous culture? You know, here in um, New Zealand, uh, what happens very quickly here, which which is also problematic, is the use of indigenous or indigenization strategies to mask you know, ongoing colonialism and ongoing racism, similarly in Canada and Australia. So, you know, settler colonial countries sort of default and they think, well, we'll just dress it up with some indigenous culture. So, so we have a different dilemma here, but I think um, in the North and Europe and the UK, you know, the, the real question and I have been thinking about it for a long time as it's so the English language itself is so built on imperialism. It's so built on its voracious appetite, appetite to appropriate language, other languages and ideas into it, that it, that it is um, difficult, challenging. I'm not ever going to say it's impossible. Uh, to decolonize what exists because it's the core of an identity and the core of um, you know what counts as normal. But I do think the work of trying to do that has to happen because I, you know for a start off 
can you can start at a lower kind of level because everything in the UK is UK centric. It's, it's northern, everything in the northern hemisphere is northern centric, you know, and, and taking some of that centricity out, um, repositioning would help. I think inclusion, some of you I know are young scholars. And you, and you probably do this very actively, which is, you know, who are you citing? Um, I grew up essentially on a on a hundred percent um, appetite, or wasn't my appetite, it was my teacher's appetite of white scholars from the UK, and then there was the transition to Europe and the US. But essentially, in my university years, you know, that's what we studied in class. And in the student union cafeteria, I studied Franz Fanon. And I, you know, I discovered Fanon. I discovered Mimi. I discovered all these, you know, um, writers, but they were not in the curriculum. They were, they were you know, passed around uh, different groups. And so there are lots of different strategies, I think, to um, begin a decolonizing journey. And the first powerful one is to start it. Thank you, Linda. Um, I know that the group that, what, some of the group that is in this room tonight um, are working in uh, groups where all the names are scholars from the Global South. Um, we have Fanon and Spivak and Lugonis um, and it's just uh, I'm, I'm so happy that we have um, uh, made <laughs> some small steps here not to be one of these institutions that only cite um, scholars from the global north and just to say that you, your work is on top of our list as well. Uh, so Hannah um, is, um, has a question there in the chat room. Um, where she is also recognising how central your work has been uh, for all of us uh, here. Um, the question is at the bottering, um, and um, uh, she would say, I was captured by the issue highlighted of universities in New Zealand taking ownership of the term university uh, or higher knowledge as it is translated into Indigenous languages. Considering the process of decolonization in academia um, uh, is confronted with the issue of the university being an inherently colonial institution, do you have more examples that you'd be willing to share of ways in which universities have made moves to engage with and recognize indigenous knowledges and culture that have caused harm? Actually, you, you might be surprised at how far our universities in New Zealand have gone. Uh, to try and be more inclusive of Māori knowledge. So mātauranga Māori is the term for Māori knowledge. It is seen as a critical part of research. Uh, scholars are funded, and, and in gov all government um, research now, really, you've got to, applicants have to demonstrate how they're being inclusive of mātauranga Māori. Um, and, you know, not just having Māori scientists working alongside them, but the, the questions they're asking also uh, take into account Māori knowledge. The university I just left, University of Waikato, is well known for uh, its very, you know, its strength in the Māori area. Māori studies has been taught for many years, but, you know, even the studies aspect has been seen as very colonizing, very controlled often by anthropology and linguistics. So breaking free of that into the more critical spaces of indigenous studies has happened more recently. Um, universities have uh, been held to more account for their Treaty of Waitangi obligations and responsibilities. And I note that uh, University of Canterbury, I think, has declared itself a Tiriti um, University, which I don't know what they mean by that, but it's an interesting uh, development. So in New Zealand universities, deeply colonial, yes, 
uh, but being forced to make um, a number of changes. You'll see that in the governance of the universities. Um, you'll see it in some aspects. If you were a stranger, you, you would probably be quite stark and obvious to you. But for Māori staff who work in the universities, uh, generally speaking, uh, these places are still deeply racist. Um, our students still experience um, racism and uh, exclusion, uh, for want of a, a better term. So despite the rhetoric and the marketing of universities, you know, at the core, they're fundamentally universities, and they've spent their entire existence to be like your universities in the UK, because you're the norm, you know, so that's who they've tried to emulate. That's the benchmarks um, that universities here in, in Australia and Canada, at least, try and emulate. And it's taken, you know, over 100 years to try and get them to understand the land they're on. It's not English land in England. The land they're on is here in Aotearoa. It's our land. And it's land that we're not going to leave or give up on. And they've got to ground themselves, our realities, our lands. Doesn't mean to say you don't study, you know, global literature and things like that, but at least locate, um, you know, universities have to locate themselves intellectually spiritually, physically, materially in New Zealand or in Australia. And some of them have um, found that really difficult to do. So thank you for your questions. Thank you. Um, could we take any more questions from the room? Just a few more questions. Yeah. The question was not answered. Okay, do you want to say it again? Yeah. Hello, um, Linda. I ask um, about your perspective about uh, advantage of communalism. If there is any, I would like to know your opinion. So that question was uh, were there any advantages of colonialism? Um, oh, okay. <laughs> There's an answer for you. <laughs> There's an answer here. Um, it's um, yeah, carry on later. Yeah. I yeah. can't answer that question at all. I mean, I just can't imagine. Sorry. You know, I know that's what you know when I when I was going to school and when I was at university in a history class. I was told I should be grateful. We should be grateful we were colonized. And then it was like, you should be so grateful you were colonized by the British, <laughs> you know, and not that group and not that group. And I, I, why would we be grateful to have had our freedom taken, our right to be who we were taken? It's an interesting, um, it's something we will never know. We never had that opportunity. And we had a treaty. Linda, you did identify um, uh, some successes in New Zealand in the ways that the university had recognised Maori culture. Um, so on a more optimistic note, uh, could I take advantage of my position as chair uh, to ask you what are the points of pressure that are potentially helpful ways to push forward? Where, where are the points of pressure and are there any um, strategies in particular that you would um, suggest uh, for us to engage in this brutal work, as you called it, of changing the university. There's always this tension between, uh, for us anyway, sort of what I would call indigenization strategies because, it, because it's common across 
um, I think in South Africa, as well as Canada, Australia, New Zealand, in particular, where there are these efforts to indigenize aspects um, of universities. But you can't do that with, without indigenous people. And so, you know, one of the tensions is how do you build the capacity of indigenous um, scholars and, you know, indigenous students at undergraduate level and bring them through at graduate level who are trained to do that. It's not that we don't have indigenous scholars, but if you're trained in a particular discipline that takes you um, away from home, you're not really trained to do the indigenous work that's required. Very, you know, many indigenous scholars um, have been successful because they've been educated in private schools. Um, they've, you know, not had their language. They've, their, their lives have been channeled into what we would call an assimilationary kind of channel. And so for many of them, then they've found their indigenous identity and had to rebuild what that means, and revitalize their own language. And that, you know, sets them at a disadvantage for trying then to do this work in the university. So the, the responsibility, the labor, the cultural labor falls on a few Māori staff inside institutions to do all this transformative work. And it is exhausting. Uh, it, it, it happens at the detriment to their own career advancement. And then if they speak too strongly, um, then the university censures them. Um, you know, so that that's a real um, pressure point for us is we need people within the university, not just allies. Allies are useful to, you know, to do a lot of what we have to do. They're, and and they're really good when they're backing us up and protecting our backs and our sides. But then there are a few of us who have had to push the struggle through and um, it wears you down. Yeah. yeah, these are very powerful, powerful comments. Um, I think um, it is time for us to thank you, Linda, uh, for sharing all these uh, insights with us, um, even if many of them are um, quite disturbing and um, depressing. It does show us, you have showed us tonight the, the scale of the task that is um, sits ahead of us. Um, so yeah, courage to everyone in the room and online uh, for this important work. Uh, but also, can you join me in thanking uh, Professor Smith for a really uh, wonderful talk and for joining us tonight? Yeah. Thank you so much, Linda. You have really provided us a, a fantastically generative uh, talk. Uh, very grateful to you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Have a lovely evening. And thank you to everyone for joining us. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Say what's happening next week. Who's next week?